Buxton Andrus, and this is Ingenious Designs. I've made a few bookbinding tutorials on this channel with the goal of showing that this hobby can be affordable and accessible at home. But there's one major obstacle to getting started in bookbinding that we haven't addressed yet, and that's coming up with designs for your books in the first place. In this video, we're going to go through that whole creative process, from display plans all the way through the final product. I'm going to discuss the general principles that I use, but I'm also going to make things a little bit more concrete by applying those principles to design a new cover for this book, selling it, a delightful read on uh, marketing mishaps. Let's make it happen! Unless this is your first leather-bound book, you should start by considering what editions your creation will sit next to on the shelf. I organize my books primarily into rows of matching height and color. Most of these professionally bound 9-inch tall books have a light brown hue, so when I bind books in that size that aren't part of some other series, I choose a leather color that will fit in with this row. This Easton Press edition of She Stoops to Conquer used to be a loner because of its unique dimensions, but when I bought the score to The Pirates of Penzance, I found that it had the same page measurements. I knew I would display these books side by side, so I incorporated blue leather, swirling motifs, and vertical text into the design of my spine, so they would look like they belonged together. Book theme can be another organizing principle. For example, I already owned this series of inspirational Judeo-Christian books, so when I bought other books with that general theme, I specifically purchased editions with the same size of text block, so I could imitate the cover art and add them as unofficial members of the collection. You may also want to design your books to adapt to several different organizational approaches. For example, I have miniature collections authored by J.R.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, James Gurney, and Ricardo Delgado, all bound in matching green leather. Most are displayed separate from each other at the moment, but the Gurney books and Tolkien books are the same height, so someday I might want to put them in a row together. The Narnia books are a different height, but as fantasy classics, I might someday want to display them next to The Lord of the Rings. Similarly, Gurney and Delgado's books have shared dinosaur themes, so they all get the same color leather despite their different sizes. One final thing to consider is whether your book is going to be displayed as the main feature on your shelf or not. For me, although I love every book that I bind, aesthetically they actually function more as the negative space on my shelves, with statues and other bric-a-brac really being the visual focal points. As a result, I try to avoid excessive eye-catching designs on most book spines, and I choose to decorate the spines with subdued gold tones rather than bright reflective foil. So with all this in mind, where on my shelf does selling it belong? So far it's the first business book in my collection, so there are no thematically similar books to match. As a result, its color will be determined by its height. My text block is the same height as these three books. Two have black covers, and one is deep maroon. The maroon is so dark that it's almost black anyway, so black leather it is. Additionally, to match the books beside it, we know that the title on selling its spine should read horizontally. I build my cover art on Adobe Illustrator, but any design software will work, as long as it can export in vector image formats like SVG or DXF. I start the process by drawing boxes that represent my covers and spine. The cover boxes are about a quarter inch taller and wider than the text block of my book, and I measure the width of the spine by hand. Art on leather-bound books typically doesn't fill the entire cover, so next I draw out my actual working space, with at least quarter inch margins on all sides. The spine is a little different though, with margins at the top and the bottom, but not on the sides. The spine also has quarter inch spaces set aside for raised bands, also known as hubs. The number and spacing of the hubs varies from volume to volume, but 4 is the most conventional number. The most basic spine layout has a quarter inch margin at the top, followed by some art, a hub, a large space for the title centered around one third of the distance from the top, hub, art, hub, small space for the author's name, hub, design, and bottom margin. Although I usually decorate my books with vinyl, to make a classic looking cover, it helps to remember how books are gilded traditionally. A bookbinder uses heated stamps to press designs into the leather. Typically, the same stamps are used on the cover borders and on the spine for a unified look. When decorating with vinyl as I do, you're not restricted to a limited number of tools, but I find that my results still look more professional if I sort of pretend that I'm making the book traditionally and pick a small number of images as stamps to build my patterns. 
There are millions of PNG clip art images available from free databases online. I use search terms like silhouette or black and white to help me find pictures which Illustrator can import easily. I like to use pictures which are thematically consistent with each book. Crossed claw slashes for a dinosaur comic, a quilt design for a book about pioneers of the American West, and medieval tapestry patterns for a classic fantasy series. Most traditional book borders rely heavily on straight lines and right angles that are both vertically and horizontally symmetrical, so that's what I'm going to do here, but it's certainly not the only direction you could go. Some of my favorite creations have thrown the whole stamp concept out the window in favor of organic, flowing lines. To complement selling its marketing theme, I'm going to build my border out of dollar signs. But I don't want to be too on the nose about it, so I'll flip my stamp horizontally and vertically to make a flowing pattern that doesn't straight up scream. Inside the borders, you can add any design you want, from generic filigree to detailed pictures, whatever conveys the tone and content of your book best. Personally, I don't often put titles on the front cover, but I think it's appropriate for a whimsical book like Selling It. Since the border design is so busy, I'm going to balance that out with plenty of negative space inside and finish off the design with just one cartoony image. This lady also illustrates another point. If you choose to include any pictures of faces or other subjects where shading matters, you have to think ahead and design them with the dark and light portions reversed. <laughs> It looks unnatural when designing on a white background, but in practice, the gold designs will function as highlights in the picture, while shadows will be provided by the dark leather of the book. You might choose to highlight a feature or two of your cover by cutting it out of a different color or type of vinyl, like a reflective foil. If you don't overdo it, this can add a nice visual focal point, but be sure to include some kind of frame in the normal vinyl color to help you position your featured element correctly. Featured pictures like this are one of my favorite ways to distinguish one book from another in a series. The biggest challenge in designing a book series isn't the covers, though. It's the spine. Because each book of a series may have a different width, it's important to decorate with art that can grow laterally without becoming distorted. You can create different graphics for each book, of course, but it can be difficult to come up with so many designs that are at once stylistically consistent but unique. A simpler approach is to use one adaptable design consisting of a frame that can stretch to any width and an image that floats inside it. Variations on this two-step formula can be found in almost all of the series that I bind. At this point, I know what I want selling its new cover to look like. But I may need to do a little extra work to get my vinyl cutter to execute that vision successfully. Most importantly, I need to export my design as a vector image. Basically, there are two ways that computers can store images. The first is pixels, hundreds or thousands of little dots of color. This familiar format includes JPEGs and PNGs, and is excellent for printers, which literally spray color dots. But that's not how a vinyl cutter works. The cutter is a robot which moves a blade to cut along paths defined by mathematical formulas called vectors. The summary of those paths is a vector image. Now you can give your vinyl cutter a pixel image to work with, and it will have software that tries to identify the shapes in the picture and reproduce them with vectors, but the translation is never perfect, and you lose a lot of crispness and resolution. If you want details like tiny letters or lines close together, you need to give the robot your design in the language it speaks. Vector images like SVG or DXF. Of course, you might have used pixel images to create your art in the first place, but design software like Illustrator is much more adept than a vinyl cutter at translating between the two formats. Such programs will give you many options to ensure that the vector version of your images is exactly what you wanted. Even when working with vector formats, there are some pitfalls to avoid to get best results from a vinyl cutter. For example, if I draw a path like this in Illustrator, I can change the stroke width to make it look as thick as I want, but the vinyl cutter won't understand that. It only wants to cut along the path and doesn't know how thick or thin I wanted it to be. So before I export the image, I need to change this thick stroke into a volumetric shape with paths around the outside instead of the middle. Finally, if you have used overlapping shapes like the dollar signs in my border here, you'll need to fuse all those touching pieces into one shape, or the machine may try to cut all the way around each one. It takes plenty of trial and error to learn to speak robot like this, 
But if somebody as technologically inept as me can work it out, then I know there's hope for anyone. And that's done it. The world now has one more leather-bound book that nobody ever expected would get this kind of treatment. It may not be the best I've ever made, but it does illustrate most of the major principles that go into designing a cover. I hope that this has given you a leg up and that it'll help this hobby to feel a little easier to start for you. As always, I'm available to answer questions in the comments, so I look forward to interacting with all of you there and in many more videos to come. Ciao.